Okay, so let's take inventory. We've looked at oscillators that natively generate sawtooths, and we've looked at oscillators that natively generate triangles. In addition to generally talking about scaling and shifting waveforms, we've seen how to turn sawtooth waves into triangle waves, and triangle waves into sawtooth waves, and sawtooth waves into pulse waves. So, for our last main simple waveform transformation, let's turn triangle waves into sine waves. So in this lecture, I'm just going to present a menagerie of different triangle to sine wave shapers. I'm not going to analyze any of these in detail. I'm just wanting to give you a general overview so that you recognize these kinds of circuits when you run across them. So continuing our look at Ray Wilson's VCO, we saw that he generated a sawtooth wave, turned it into a triangle wave, and then we have the circuitry down here that transforms the triangle wave into a sine wave. Now here we have a 3080 OTA, but we're not using this as a voltage controlled amplifier. In fact, the control current is just generated by this fixed resistor here, this 200K. So let's see, the current control pin input usually sits around a quote unquote diode drop above what the negative rail is. So let's say, I don't know, 0.7 volts, something like that. So let's say the voltage dropping across the resistor is 12 minus minus 11.3. That's 23.3 volts divided by the resistance, which is 200K. So the control current going in is like 0.1165 milliamps, which isn't very much. Let's take that and multiply that by our magical 19.2 to find out what the transconductance gain of the OTA is. We'll see it's set at 0.0022368. Okay. Hmm. You know what? Let me include the divide down ladder in front. So I'm doing an analysis like it's a VCA, although it's not actually, of course, a VCA because we're not actually controlling anything. This is fixed. I have 2 divided by 82 plus 2. Okay, I've got that number. No, I'm not really sure how to interpret what R44, the 47K resistor, is doing. So I'm just going to ignore it. And let's take the output of the OTA and run it through that 33K resistor because that 33K resistor is taking the current and turning it back into a voltage. So I'll have 33 E3 here. So I've got 1.7575. So from end to end, this isn't really providing a whole lot of gain, but we have to be careful in interpreting that number because really the analysis that we did for VCAs assumed that the OTA was operating in a linear region when the whole point of the circuit is that it exploits the hyperbolic tangent nonlinearity of the OTA and uses it to take the tips of the triangle waveform and smooth those out a bit. So you take the triangle wave and then get something more like a sine wave out. And here for both the triangle wave output and the sine wave output, we have 1K output impedances. All right, so the Aries 317 VCO is quite similar, except instead of an OTA, it gets its hyperbolic tangent nonlinearity from a discrete pair of BJT transistors. If this is a primitive do-it-yourself OTA like we saw with the Buchla 259, instead of the resistors up here, we would have a couple of transistors forming a current mirror. But here we have resistors instead, and the job of these resistors is basically to take currents and turn them into voltages. But the same underlying idea still applies. And then we have this 301 op amp here, whose job it is to take the difference of these voltages to produce our sine wave output from a triangle input. And coincidentally, the designers here also decided to have a 1K output impedance. As with a lot of these wave shapers, there's usually a lot of trim pots floating around. Here we have a triangle offset in Ray's design. And here we have one trimmer to help make sure we have a symmetric sine wave that basically is setting whatever point the input on this side is being compared to. And 
this sign purity trimmer basically controls the bias current flowing through here. And there's all sorts of interesting tidbits happening in the Moog 901B circuit here. The 901B, like every Moog design I've seen, except for the Sonic 6, actually, and presumably the Sonic 5, has a sawtooth core. The Sonic 6 and I'm pretty sure the 5 have triangle cores, but again, that wasn't originally a Moog design. It has kind of a weird history. And I'm not saying that there's no other Moog synths with triangle cores, but all of them that I've seen that I can remember have sawtooth cores. Anyway, we have a sawtooth output that we're getting right here. And notice that that goes to the output through this voltage divider here. So it seemed like the basic sawtooth created by the core is a little too hot for whatever output levels they wanted, so they're cutting that down a bit. But the sawtooth also goes to this set of circuitry in the upper right, which I looked up in the Art of Electronics, and it turns out that this is basically a discrete comparator, and that's what they use to generate the pulse output. It does look like the raw output here was considered too hot, so there's this divide down here. We also have some circuitry here that turns the sawtooth wave into a triangle wave. And something particularly interesting is that this sawtooth to triangle wave shaper is not at all like the rectifier based wave shapers we've seen previously. I think what's going on there is that it's basically making a folding kind of nonlinearity. Suppose we had a nice linearity and it looked a little something like this and we put in a sawtooth wave and we got a sawtooth wave out. No big deal. But suppose the input output relationship looked more like this. Now I'm not drawing this as a section of a waveform. I'm meaning this to represent an output and I'm meaning this horizontal axis to represent an input. So now if I were to put in a sawtooth wave that assuming the system was linear would give me something like this. Now when it hits this place where the nonlinearity folds back in on itself, it would dip back in and potentially give me a triangle. So this is actually the first stage of a much, much more complicated kind of wave shaping operation that Buchla called timbre generation and that Serge called the wave multiplier. We'll look at that and a couple of ways to implement a much more complicated version of this in a future lecture. Anyway, I just wanted to point that out because I thought that was interesting. All right. The main thing is that through whatever weird techniques that we get a triangle wave, we then get a sine wave out. Now, this is very different than what we've looked at previously. The previous triangle to sine wave shapers we've seen use the hyperbolic tangent nonlinearity of an OTA or just a BJT pair of transistors. That initial differential pair at the input is where an OTA gets its hyperbolic tangent from. So what we have here is this incredibly complicated, weird network of diodes and resistors. And depending on what kind of voltages are appearing here, various diodes will turn on or off and would then bring various sections of this into and out of the circuit. And as a first guess of what's going on, you could just ignore all of this and then just compute the various voltages at various nodes here. And that's not an entirely unreasonable way to start trying to analyze this. And basically all of this combines to give you a nice nonlinearity. I'm not going to analyze it any further than that. I just want you to be able to recognize this kind of configuration when you see it. So the Moog 921, which is a later design, developed its sine wave in a different way. Here it's using a 3046, which is a set of five matched NPN transistors. Two of them are pre-wired to act as a differential pair. Let's see, I have a trim pot here for the symmetry of the sine wave, and here's a trim pot for the offset of the sine wave, and here's one for the shape of the sine wave. So that gives you three trim pots. And again, I'm not going to analyze this in any kind of detail or at all, really. But here it is. It's fun. It's exciting. All right. It just takes a triangle in, it gives you a sine wave out with a whole bunch of trim pots. So EMS made some very interesting synthesizers under names like Synthi and VCS3. One of its most notable features is this matrix patch panel. So instead of using patch cords like a lot of synthesizers or even sliding switches on something like the ARP 2500, 
this had little pins that you would place into this matrix like you're playing a game of Battleship to make connections. And what's interesting is you could use different pins that had different resistance values associated with them. I've only been able to play one of these in person on one occasion, and it's a really awesome, surreal experience if you ever get to do that. So here we have another weird, complicated network of diodes and resistors and whatevers that do the shaping from triangle to sine. And these are all based on different diodes turning on at different points to form various breakpoints in this nonlinearity that's being generated. And as usual, there's a couple of trim pots, sine level, sine shape. And Synthi did make a few crazy big versions of this. The Synthi 100 here was owned by Jack Dangers of Meat Beat Manifesto. He could still own it. I haven't looked. I imagine that these things don't sell very often. But look at the size of the patch panels on this beast. That would be an awful lot of fun. If you moved it into your house, you'd probably have to remove a wall of your house and have people rebuild it in order to haul this thing in. Anyway, so here's the triangle to sign wave shaper of the Paya 9720 VCO. And the general idea here is that if we were to ignore these diodes for a moment, this would look more or less like an inverting op amp configuration. There is a little bit of a strange twist with this 470K resistor going to ground in the middle of the network, but that's not too scary. That's actually a relatively standard thing. The main thing I want to point out is that here we have a couple of diodes back to back. Here we have some diodes back to back, but we have two diodes in a row. And basically these are going to turn on at different overall voltage levels. Now remember, this is an instantaneous nonlinearity. When I say overall voltage levels, I don't mean something like an average power that you would compute in something like a compressor sidechain. It's time moment to time moment to time moment. So over the course of your triangle wave, when it gets to be really positive or really negative, these diodes will kick on and this resistor here will start to get bypassed. And remember, when you're computing the gain of an inverting configuration, the feedback resistance is in the numerator. So if we lower that resistance, the gain drops, and that's what pulls down the waveform at that point. Now imagine you're going even further and getting very close to the peak of the triangle wave. Well, at that point, these diodes are going to turn on, and that's going to basically then effectively bypass this resistance. And again, you would then have an additional decrease of gain that's really squishing down that peak. Now, in all of these designs with the diodes, the first Moog VCO that we looked at, the Wave Shaper and the EMS, this one right here, when I say diodes quote-unquote turn on, it's not like that's a thing that just happens instantly. So these breakpoints aren't actually that sharp. They'll have a little bit of a roundness to them, which is fine. This design is quite similar to a guitar distortion pedal design called the Marshall Blues Breaker. Marshall is mostly known for making tube amplifiers, but they also made solid state pedals. And there's a similar design with back-to-back -back diodes in a feedback loop in the Ibanez Tube Screamer, made famous by Stevie Ray Vaughan and others. The Tube Screamer is different than the Marshall Blues Breaker design. The Blues Breaker design is basically a diode-based modification of the inverting op-amp configuration, whereas the Ibanez Tube Screamer adds diodes to a non-inverting op-amp configuration. The final triangle to sine wave wave shaper circuit I want to show you was, was a favorite of Don Bukla. Here's the main triangle core from the Bukla 259 that we spent a lot of time analyzing a few lectures ago. It created a triangle wave. And then here you can see this weird little circuit that takes a triangle wave in and gives you a sine wave out. And basically you have a couple of resistors here. You have a couple of resistors here on either side of a JFET. Here it's an INFET. And here you have a couple of diodes. And it would be a real fun activity to analyze this and figure out how it works. I've never got around to that. You'll see this configuration used a lot. It's used in Buchla's earlier oscillators like the 258 and the oscillators in the Buchla Music Easel. And I've seen Buchla use it in a much older module, namely the 148 harmonic generator.
And just for reference, this circuit didn't originate with Buchla. It showed up in a paper sometime earlier.